Hi, everyone. Welcome to Anesthesia Coffee Break and another episode of Respiratory Physiology with Archit. How's it going, Archit? Yeah, good. Thanks, Lahiru. Um, for all those people that are I guess it depends on when this uh, episode comes out. If you've already done your uh, primaries, then I hope we're thinking of you. Hopefully everything went well. And if you haven't yet done your primaries, all the very best. We're also thinking of you in that scenario. So pretty much we're just we're just thinking of people. Yeah, <laughs> we're, yeah. we're thinking of you. I keep saying this, that the there's always an exam happening, whether it's a primary or the final or trying to get yeah. into training. Like, there's no, I feel like there's just no time when a department of anesthesia is ever relaxed. Like maybe in like there's a period between like I don't know, maybe December and January when things are a little bit settled and the rest of the year is just hectic. Yeah, exactly. Um, hey, so let's talk about work of breathing. Uh, really important because when you think about the energy expenditure of the lungs and you know and, and how they ventilate, it's 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 a really big deal because when it comes to di- di- when it comes to disease, uh, the body really wants to be as efficient as possible, and you know there's a lot of energy that's expended from from breathing. So let's um crack on. Um, Archie, do you want to describe for us the work of breathing? Maybe we can go through things like uh, you know what what it actually means, what the formula is, um, how how much the mils of oxygen per minute might be, its efficiency, and the units as well. Um, go for it. Yeah, so work of breathing, um, so the work in general describes power. So think in joules. Um, in the respiratory context, work of breathing describes... Oh, the- work, work, work is definitely not power. It is just energy. So that's, oh, no. that's, that's a really good thing to get out there. Like, you know, yeah. power is uh, energy per unit time. Yeah. Work is energy. Yeah. Yeah, work is energy and power, yeah, as per unit of time. In the respiratory context, though, um, work of breathing describes the power that is needed to overcome um, elastic and non-elastic um, resistance during inspiration, which is the, in, in the normal breathing. Um, expiration, in this case, is a passive process. So there's no work done unless there's pathological states, and we'll talk about them um, after. As we mentioned, it's um, measured in joules. So, Lahiru, take us through the sort of derivation of the formula for work of breathing. Yeah, like if you, if you imagine back to physics days in high school where work is force times distance. So, you know, just imagine newtons uh, times meters. So it's newton meters equals joules. So that's 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 how it works. But when, we, when we're talking about, you know, lung mechanics and we, we, we've got a pressure volume curve, how how is it? that pressure times volume also equals joules. So that's a bit of a conundrum, right? Force times distance can, is, is joules and pressure times volume is also joules. So the way they derive it is, is one of those things where you, you do unitary analysis. So if you think of force, that's pressure times area, and then you multiply that by distance, which is also equal to volume over area. Now, just again, it's, it's, it's there's just a podcast, um, but on, uh, you know, it's not, not not always easy to conceptualize this, but imagine distance is in meters, volume is meters cubed, area is meters squared. So if you know, if you go meters cubed over meters squared, you know, two to the three divided by two to the power of two is just just meters. So now that, that, that's why volume over area works. So if you imagine pressure times area multiplied by volume over area, if you cancel area, you're left with pressure times volume so that that's that's as as straightforward as this um yeah yeah, what do you think about the overall like how does it relate in terms of mils of oxygen per minute metabolic rate efficiency and stuff like that yeah so some normal values for us to remember is about three mils per minute um i think that's from what what i've I've read around um efficiency being sort of approximate to about 10 percent. so it's there's a lot of um efficiency loss so it's about 10 percent in there yeah so you have three mils of oxygen per minute is less than 2% of the metabolic rate. Efficiency is 10%. And this efficiency, interestingly, becomes even worse uh, uh, you know, as you're ex- uh, in increase in respiration to, to a point where at a certain respiratory rate, the amount of oxygen you're gaining through ventilation is all used up by the ventilation. So you can't just take someone's lungs and just you, you, you know absolutely hammer them with increasing minute ventilation because at a certain point a, p- a patient just won't be able to obviously a ventilated patient doesn't exert their own force they're not generating the negative pressure so your ventilator is so that's very different but a human on their own will at a certain point will not be 
it won't be useful to ventilate any harder than they are already. So imagine like the severe lung disease, asthmatics, they're trying to get as much oxygen in the lungs. It might be hyperventilating. Uh, same with any other kind of restricted lung disease. Any problems with lungs, you don't over, you don't, you're not able to compensate up to a certain point. Mm. Um, and just to reassure, uh, just to reaffirm everyone, so it's work, it's definitely not power. We're not talking about joules per second. And mm. it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing, like in, in med- I think even in medicine, people ter- throw around terms all the time, like, but, but, but you know, words have meanings. Like I, I think I've recently have been talking a lot about medications and people often talk about potency like it's this thing. It, it's like the absolute effect of a drug, but it really it isn't, you know, potency is just you know, how much of a molecule will have a certain effect that if, if if it's a really potent molecule, it might have very little effect, but just less molecules create the little effect. So that's mm-hmm. still highly potent drug. Um, and, you know, highly efficacious drug is something that has a maximum effect. Um, so anyway, that's just a bit of a side note, but the, mm-hmm. the, these words really matter for the primary exam. So getting your definitions and understanding is extremely useful. So power would then be work over seconds. Uh, work per second, work yeah. time, joules per second. Yeah. Um, keep going. So how, how would you, I guess, classify the different elements of uh, work of breathing? So as we mentioned, I think uh, elastic and non-elastic ways are the best ways to sort of potentially go about categorizing these. Mm-hmm. Within the elastic, um, if you think about it, we've talked about a lot about that gas alveolar interface in the previous episodes. And one of the biggest things there is um, surfactant and the compliance and the effect of that. So that obviously has a really big input into um, your work of breathing. So and then you all... Just to pause, yeah. just to pause there, that's exactly right. So if you just think of elastic factors, which you already have learned because that's compliance, hmm. anything that affects the distensibility, big part is surfactant, but lots of other stuff, including lung volumes and restrictive chest. So if you just imagine, you know, maybe in the lung, the lung interface, chest wall, um, and try to categorize in some way, you'll get all the factors for elastic factors. Um, keep going. Yeah, so elastic, like as we mentioned, elastic recoil of the chest and then and then the alveolar, lung volumes and the tidal volumes as well, that it all plays into it. So as we mentioned, um, go through, work it, work it out from maybe out to in and then you, you'll be able to sort of cover most of those. Non-elastic um, factors include things like airway resistance, so things such as your endotracheal tube itself, your lung volumes, and then the flow, which is what we've also talked about before, whether it's laminar flow, turbulent flow. Um, And then you've also got tissue resistance that you've got to overcome as well. So again, we've got our chest wall resistance, we've got our lung resistance. And then if you think about it, any sort of outward compression, so whether this be, you know, uh, tumor or external sort of displacement of intra-abdominal cavities, that we need to overcome that uh, amount that also increases the work of um, breathing. Yeah, interesting. Um, I would almost, so just to get back to the non-elastic forces, you're absolutely right. Uh, air was resistance, lots of factors affected. And the one thing to always mention there, bar none, is radius. But just because radius has mm. such an incredible effect on both laminar flow and turbulent flow to a magnitude of, to the power of four. So, you know, mm. if you decrease radius by half, you make it far worse than just a half more or times two more resistance. Um, so that's really important. Tissue resistance is actually the, um, uh, I'd almost not describe it in, in the terms of chest wall resistance. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure that's the exact right term, but it's the frictional forces caused by the uh, interface between the lung and the wall that, like say the fluid layer there. So mm. that's more what the tissue resistance is talking about. Maybe the, w- what you said is t- you know technically correct. I've just heard it in a different way. It's it only amount. It only generally in well patients is a very small mm. part of that. Um, yeah, that's good. So elastic and non-elastic, and now this goes onto a graph that can be pretty confusing. Um, yeah, I think um, this graph is something that's uh, taken a fair bit of time to sort of get on to. So Lahiru, I'll I'll absolutely let you take this away. Yeah, absolutely. So I've just put up some graphs and the first ones there are from West and another one is actually from some of the notes that were passed down. A lot lot of, a lot of with this exam, uh, notes are passed down. I don't know where they go from, but this is, you know, nicely drawn. And you can see it on the YouTube clip on this. Um, again, just check out the ABCs of Anesthesia YouTube channel. 
and you can then see um, uh, probably the primary exam playlist is where this will be and also the ABCs of Anesthesia podcast playlist. Okay, so getting, getting on, you can see all these structures and hopefully you can see my arrows. Now, this graph is probably the common graph that we look at and I actually like the way this one is drawn at the bottom here. So first of all, on the x-axis, we have the intrapural pressure from negative five resting to negative eight at end inspiratory and then volume on the y-axis. So first of all, that is work. It's you know pressure times volume. That's the first thing to note. If you look at the total graph here, that's your total work. And I've got these points which are kind of hard to see, but it's A, B, C, D, and then E, F. E is the line that goes straight through that the, the ellipse in the uh, center there. Now, the total work is obviously all of that uh, that's transcribed, um, and that's the total work of breathing. Now, if you in inspiration, let's um, let's take the two separate aspects. So we've got elastic forces and the non-elastic forces. So the elastic for forces on inspiration is A, E, C, D, A. So it's that triangle there. So that's good to know there. And then your non-elastic, so you know your um, airways resistance and tissue resistance, that's this little ellipse here. So A, B, C, E, A, the little ellipse there is the energy required to overcome the non-elastic forces. That's inspiration. On expiration, we have, again, the non-elastic work is now A, E, C, F, A. So there's no more elastic work needed, right? So A, E, C, F, A, this ellipse that goes inside the triangle, that's the energy. And it's almost always you know, roughly the same as the inspiratory non-elastic forces, but that's what you need to do to overcome it. And then the rest of that triangle, what's left is A, F, C, D, A. So whatever's left there is heat and kinetic energy of all the gases dissipated on expiration. So I guess the relevance of this is during expiration, all the energy you need for expiration to overcome your you know, non-elastic forces are held within the elastic tissues. So that's kind of what's interesting about this. What goes wrong with pathology is imagine you have really severely restrictive disease or something. Suddenly, you now have you know, really large amounts of energy and pressure needed to expand. So, you know, your, your general work, that triangular area is going to increase substantially if you're looking at this graph in the middle. So imagine in disease states, B and C, you know, just really, you know, extended. So your, your triangle now is a very large triangle because the elastic forces needed to expand the lungs are really great. Um, whereas maybe something like uh, in emphysema, the elastic force is a bit less. If you think of another disease state like asthma or you know bronchitis, we have now more airways resistance. That semi, the, the, the elliptical shape, the half the ellipse, can be extremely large. And now on expiration, it can be really large, such that the area or the energy required for expiration may not be held within the elastic, you know, the, the stored potential energy from the elastic tissues. What's the effect of that? You might. In, instead of having passive expiration, um, where, where the energy is stored and just allows you to overcome the non-elastic resistance on expiration, now you've got to generate energy to do that. So increase your, increasing your work of breathing, increasing energy requirements, this can be not a great state for your patient. So that's kind of the relevance of this work of breathing graphs. And you, in, you know, in the exam, you might be asked to explore these, um, explore these to uh, just explain what's going on. Cool. Um, so that's that's really ex um, describing that's really describing the lung mechanics in common disease states. Um, and the, I guess the other thing to note then is if you imagine a normal lung. So imagine the total work of breathing. And I might actually put up this next um, graph as well. This again from West's. Again, check out the visual on on the on YouTube. So. So you can see this little graph here, which you show is normal, increased elastic resistance and increased airflow resistance. So imagine in that middle box with increased elastic resistance, that's a restrictive, like fibrotic disease process and increased airflow resistance might be asthma or bronchitis or something like that. Now, the, the red line here is your total work of breathing and it's comprised of your airflow resistance, which increases with increase in respirate um, for any same minute ventilation. And elastic resistance goes down 
um, through the graph as you increase your rest rate for any constant minute ventilation. Um, if you imagine 15 is roughly the sweet spot where that's the minimum work in breathing where your airflow and elastic resistance have are at their average minimum amounts. Um, with if, if, if you make the lungs more stiff, so you need increased, there's increased elastic resistance, now it favors you having a higher respiratory rate because right now your airflow resistance isn't the problem here, but your elastic resistance, you need you, you just don't want to stretch the lungs out too much because stretching them past a certain point requires so much energy and very little gain. So high respiratory rate is ideal for restrictive disease. Um, now imagine you've got someone with you know long-standing bronchitis. Now you've got a problem where it's far better to have them on a slower respiratory rate because your airflow is a problem. If you try to have fast respiratory rates with fast airflow, that will increase your turbulence and increase your problems with um, airways resistance. So it's far better because the elastic isn't the elastic problems aren't there, just allow slow respirations. Um, so imagine in when I the, the real advantage of this is now how do you set your ventilator? If you've got someone who's had a severe bronco bronchospasm kind of disease or they've got bad obstructive disease, I have them on lower respiratory rates, which is where we talk about the long expiratory time or increasing that or IE ratio. So instead of one to two, you have an IE ratio of one to three or four. It's the total expiratory time, so I care more that the respiratory rate is low than the absolute numbers of the IE ratios. Whereas if I have someone who's, you know, I recently had a really obese patient with severe COVID pneumonia, um, long COVID, and you know, some real bad lung disease from that, I was ventilating that patient on a respiratory of twenty uh, with high pressures, and that allowed me not to need to, uh, you know, to try and uh, you know, have enough of a minute ventilation. I just needed a higher respiratory for that. That's the yes. That's probably work of breathing in a nutshell. Yeah, that's um. It, it might be including me something that I need to listen to the episode maybe two or three times again. <laughs> um, it's just one of those things where it's uh, conceptually a little bit more abstract and difficult to think about. But um, all these graphs and stuff, uh, have a look and go through it, and it starts to make sense by the end. Or I hope that's right. And and so you know, if I could give you any take home message, off obviously. You just have to draw those graphs for this exam a lot, like, you know, just to not stuff up while you're talking about them, because it's really easy to confuse it. Maybe there's some kind of mnemonic there where, you know, just imagine that the triangle shape is the elastic shape. Uh, we should probably come up with some kind of mnemonic for that. Um, whereas the bulging part, the elliptical part is the airflow resistance. Um, anyway, we can, we can we can think about how to remember that. But really, from a practical point of view, just remember, restrictive lung disease needs a high respiratory rate. Obstructive lung disease needs a lower respiratory rate. And really, practically speaking, that's the day-to-day of how I use this information in real life. Yeah, brilliant. Excellent. So we should probably end that episode there. Thanks very much to everyone listening. And yeah, please check out the YouTube channel for the pictures. And obviously, West's um, pulmonary physiology, respiratory physiology is, is a really amazing resource um, for your exams. Definitely use that with the syllabus and other people's notes because often having exam focused study is a lot more useful than just reading it from the textbook. Thanks guys and see you next time. See you later guys. Now what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey from medical student to procedural skills from foundations in anesthesia as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well.